Hello there, Rantbot TV watchers. I'm Simon. I'm your host once again. I'm joined by a fantastic panel uh, that will bring you nuanced commentary on societal issues and many other issues that are affecting us today as a community. Our series of discussions on cancel culture have been proved to be quite complicated, but fascinating. Week one, we asked who benefits from culture, cancel culture. Week two, we covered virtue ethics and signaling and how brands, brands have harnessed guilt as a marketing tool, in, in my opinion. But I think we covered it. This week, we will continue discussion. So, John has actually got a video that he will present now. Um, and he will just give us an overview of the case of Martina Naratilova potentially being cancelled a few years ago. In the 1980s, Martina Navratilova became one of the only openly gay celebrities in the world, an LGBTQ and feminist pioneer and an outspoken political dissident. Along with Billie Jean King, she led the way in building a space for women to commercially succeed on equal terms with men in the world of professional sports. She transformed the conception of what female athletes are capable of achieving. Her training regimen and body transformation to this day inspire how female athletes train. Now, in December 2018, Navratilova shared a tweet of transgender athlete Veronica Ivey, a trans woman who, without undergoing sex reassignment surgery, was competing as a professional athlete in women's sports, specifically cycling. This trans woman was not only competing, but beginning to win, sometimes in a dominant fashion, even though in her mid thirties, she was already past the normal prime for cycling competition. Now, the tweet read, clearly that can't be right. You can't just declare yourself to be a female and be able to compete against women. There must be some standards, and having a penis and competing as a woman would not fit that standard. So the condemnations were led by Ivy. As you can imagine, many people on the internet were um, up in arms about what Navratilova happened to share. Ivy tweeted, well, guess Nat Navratilova is transphobic. Ivy then issued her marching orders she could delete the tweets and replace them with an apology. Much of Twitter was roiled with accusations that Navratilova, due to a single tweet, was a bigot and an enemy of the trans movement. So, for all wants and purposes, the internet labeled Navratilova transphobic. Navratilova deleted tweets, deemed offensive, made apologies, which were rebuffed by Ivy, and then finally decided to go away and do research. Fast forward to February 17th, 2019, and Navratilova put out a tweet, and it goes as follows. To put the argument at its most basic, a man can decide to be female, take hormones if required by whatever sporting organization is concerned, win everything in sight and perhaps earn a small fortune and then reverse his decision and go back to making babies if he so desires. It's insane and it's cheating. I am happy to address a transgender woman in whatever form she prefers, but I would not be happy to compete against her. It would not be fair. Subsequently, Navratilova's tweet, which I've just read, appeared in a piece by The Telegraph, a UK broadsheet. Um, also, uh, Rene Richards, um, Navratilova's former coach, put forward this statement. The notion that one can take hormones and be considered a woman without sex reassignment surgery is nuts in my opinion which is also said, also revealed that she would never have competed as a woman if she had transitioned in her 20s rather than 40s because she would have been beaten um, to a pulp. Um, so that's Navratilova's old coach and friend, Renny Richards. Navratilova promptly tweeted, or retweeted rather, the interview with the quote, my friend, Renny Richards. Now, 
Navratilova, the LGBTQ icon and feminist pioneer in sports, was expelled from Athlete Ally, a group that advocates for LGBTQ athletes. In its statement, the group said Navratilova's article was transphobic, based on the false understanding of science and data, and perpetuates dangerous myths that le lead to the ongoing targeting of trans people through to discriminatory laws, hateful stereotypes, and disproportionate violence. Now, in March 4th, 2019, Navratilova said that she was sorry for suggesting that transgender athletes in general are cheats. She also added that there was no perfect solution to this issue, and that if everyone was included, women's sports as we now know them would cease to exist. Uh, so, my question would be, does anyone have anything to say about Navratilova's cancellation? I have a few things to say. You've heard the basic facts. I leave it to you. Great. Thanks very much, John. Um, now, I want to invite you to come and sort of follow up with that, please, and give us your opinion on what happened in the Navratilova case. Sure. Um, I'll firstly state this. Do trans people need yet more people with massive platforms creating hoops of validation for them to jump through? I really don't think so. If that idea could get more traction, great. But since identity politics plus Twitter equals witch hunt, that toxic idea runs free to continue being a problem for the perception of these people. Mainstream media isn't investigative enough for such conclusions. Media often takes its cues from prominent members of the LGBTQ community. They'd rather give updates on the latest victim of the so-called mob. So Navratilova's views and first mainstream media are not counterpointed by someone of equal media presence. This results in long held simplified conclusions which emphasize biology over psyche to remain uncriticized. Um, I, there's a lot more to say and I want other people to say stuff. So just for this beginning salvo, I'll finish with this. There's a, a recklessness in Navratilova's language, which has continually been employed by her. Now, Dr. Veronica Ivy is not big enough a name to affect uh, in conversation in the same manner that Navratilova can. In short, we're in a world where influence seems to trump reason. Shouldn't Navratilova acknowledge this before making statements about penises and cheating? Only, and only one case to back up her opinions on translated sporting issues as far as her Twitter um, uh, occasions have, have been uh, to, have been to, um, have, have been used to attest. So yeah, that's what I have to say for now. Okay, fantastic, Alice. Um, have you got anything to say on that? Um, yes, so um, I agree that she, like when you mentioned about reckless language, John, some of the stuff that she was saying in the tweet, it was quite inflammatory towards the community. And you can see kind of why people kicked off about it. But my, going back to her original tweet, you know, people demanded apologies from her um, and she, she did apologise, but then... Um, it was kind of not accepted. It was, she was told she was continuing to be cancelled. And it's more of a, like a question that I'm thinking of, like why demand that apology She from someone who clearly was just asking a question? Why demand the apology if you're not going to accept it? And I think we've kind of touched on this in previous episodes about cancel culture. It's more just, it's a witch hunt. It's not really It's not really about educating anyone. It's not about taking us forward into a more like progressive society kind of thing. So yeah, while a tweet initially probably was a bit inflammatory, like, you know, you've, she's apologised originally, but no one really accepted that. And that was what bothered me most about the case altogether. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Ollie, um, please go ahead. I think um, just to be devil's advocate in this particular example, I think the one thing with Navratilova is that, and I do not deny for any moment in time that basically what she did was a giant, giant faux pas and a huge mistake because as, as John said, you know, it's inflammatory, it's ridiculous. I think there's an element here where obviously 
there is an element of an old school wave of um, people who would refer to themselves as minorities, gender minorities, however you'd like it, and then the newer LGBTQ plus society and these two elements. Um, I kind of grew up in the middle changeover point of that. And I can see why someone like Navratilova, who's clearly not transphobic, you know, in the literal meaning of the word, because obviously her coach is trans, you know, she's not against this stuff. I can see why she would immediately go to a slightly older perspective. Um, I think it's it's more upsetting that I think that maybe she, yeah, she fired off without thinking, but that is the kind of thing that Twitter encourages. Um, <laughs> It's such a difficult point um, to to come to because, um, as I'm sure all aware, she's a hero to to most LGTB people. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I personally, for me, I think it's one thing for her to shoot her mouth off and and then say sorry, but then to come back a year later and be like, no, I'm sticking to my guns, is is not so great. Um, but I feel like, and I'm sure I'm gonna come back to this later, it dovetails into a much larger problem, which is how you define sex, uh, not just gender, in sport, because there is no solid line. And that line keeps moving and has been moving for about a hundred years now. Um, trans athletes are another victim of a thing that's claimed so many other female athletes already in the past, um, people like Casta Semenya, um from south africa and even people as far back as you know like in the 50s you know this is a real problem when we went from um checking people's genitals in a horrible naked lineup to chromosome testing to testosterone testing to all manner of nebulous uh, boundaries so yeah i'm kind of on the fence with with her um but again like i say that's a matter i think of of age and background coming into a modern sensibility. So yeah, I feel like there's maybe some forgiveness there, but hard to say. Thanks very much, Oli. Uh, Reshma, I think you have something else to say. Yes, okay. Well, first of all, thank you, John, for the brilliant summary. I think that it's an excellent way of, of summarizing the whole thing, you know, unbiased. So that was very helpful. And it was interesting because what stood out to me when watching it was um, the, the athlete ally, is it called the organization? And, um, um, and how they went about responding to her, which I didn't sort of pick, pick up on when I initially sort of looked at the story. So that's why it was, it was extra helpful. But um, I was noticing that if they really wanted to look at the science and educate her or educate anyone else who maybe isn't sort of up to scratch with the, with the now, if you know what I mean, because as Oliver was saying, it's um, things change quite rapidly. And from the time when sort of she was a hero, she still is, but at the time when, you know, she was doing revolutionary things um, in comparison to now, a lot has changed in definition. And so if you really did want to explain those changes in definition scientifically and um, in sports to somebody who, who's not responding, I think they claim she didn't respond, then you could do that publicly. If you, if it's really about education, you could, instead of saying, oh, she didn't respond and making her look bad and sort of, you know, sort of helping to get her canceled, you could say, okay, this is what we would have said if she had wanted to hear from us and anyone else who doesn't understand, this is the science. That would have been helpful if that was attached to their initial sort of um, statement, in my opinion. And what do you think? It would be helpful in many of these type of situations. Um, but for myself, I think, I think Oli touched on it and we've touched on it before. This is a clear example of the Twitter box, 140 characters uh, of someone putting across a statement, but not allowing people the opportunity to really explain themselves as well. And people then respond to the original statement, not looking into what the context is or anything of that nature. Um, and the media pick up on this as well. And they take a piece of text, a soundbite or anything and twist it into a sensational headline, which as we discussed last week, clicks means money 
advertising revenue and so and and the likes as well now i just want to take it a little bit to another direction because i had the chance to speak to a friend of mine who whose uh child is transitioning and they and i spoke to them about this situation and and asked them where do they stand on this in regards to their child you know moving from one side to the other and being involved in sport now the child is still of an age pre-puberty as well um and they've known for quite some time that they were going to change And the parents, my friend said to me, it's complicated, it's deep, it's hard. As a parent, she she wants to give their child all the opportunities to be included in everything and not to be uh, told you can't do this because of their gender. However, she's also worried one way or the other that they could get hurt because of their gender in, in respect. So this subject cannot be just um, answered by, you know, in a Twitter court or anything of that nature. And and this happens lots and lots of times where someone is demonized by online. So it's without people really not knowing what it's like to actually be in the situation. So I open that up or. Mm-hmm. What's your direct question? So my question going back to this is, what we discussed, John, in regards to parity and fairness in sport, while we all want, we all have an idea of being inclusive uh, and wanted everyone to have a fair chance at doing whatever they want, is sport separate? Is, are things like sport separate? And in turn, with sport, are there certain categories that should be held separately away from general society? Um, honestly, um, I'm going to paraphrase a few things that uh, Ivy McKinnon was saying. I mean, there is no debate to be had over whether trans women athletes have an unfair advantage. It's clear that they don't, she said. Since uh, November 2003, the IOC policy openly allowing trans women to compete, not a single trans athlete has ever even qualified to be in the Olympics, let alone won a medal. Um, this remains true even after the November 2015 IOC policy, making it easier for trans women to compete. No trans woman has won an elite world championship medal. The fear that trans women will suddenly take over sport is irrational, which is the very definition of transphobia. Um, I did some more research. There was um, uh, a case in the States of two uh, very young uh, pre-pubescent um, athletes who had been running and winning quite a few events. They were both transgender. And that case was being used as a way of scaring various states into having legislation against um, uh, transgender people. I think Minnesota has actually um, launched some legislation into that. I'll put that into the description box so people can check that out. So that's my opinion. I, this idea of there being an unfair advantage has become in itself reasoning um, for, or, or, or rational, uh, you know, uh, reason for people to take this to a really strange level. Um, Alice, do you have anything to say on that? Um, just, yeah, um, just collecting my thoughts a minute. Okay. That's very nice, John. Um, no, um, I agree. It has become, it's a bit of scaremongering, like you're saying. You know, it's um. I don't. I honestly don't think that tra- anyone transgender does have an inf- a, fa- um, a fair advantage over anyone else in the sporting world. Like even if we put aside the physical um kind of potential advantages that people might be worried about, there's a lot of barriers in sports as well, isn't there? Like um about sexuality and gender and stuff like that. So even if you know all of the if they did have physical advantages like it's the difficulty of how far can you progress when you're in an industry that might not accept you for that if that makes any sense definitely definitely um i'll come to ollie next please i think um i think one thing i would say is that um obviously yeah the idea of 
of, of using an unfair advantage to scaremonger people is definitely transphobic. Um, it's the ammunition that people use to bring their story into the spotlight in order to create fear and discomfort and sell newspapers and or push their political agendas. So I don't deny that. Um, however, being a forward thinking futurist kind of guy, I'd like to think that maybe rather than look at this as a issue in a small box, um, to look at it holistically, as I was saying, um, there is such a problem with how we define some of these things. Um, I think there is an element, obviously, for trans people where we all have to decide, look, our subjectivity defines our gender, but our objectivity can't change. You, you have what you have and, and you make the best of it. Um, but that's going to be true of everyone of all genders. And, and, you know, with the best of intentions, we need to look at adjusting sport perhaps as a whole to accommodate people better to order to create levels of fairness. You would never put a bantamweight against a super heavyweight in a boxing match. Um, you would, you know, but you could quite easily have a Formula One race where men and women both compete at the same time. There's no reason not to do that. Likewise, um, the testosterone test is kind of dumb. It's not scientifically proven. There are no tests that prove these things. Um, so it's hard to be objective about fairness when we have no objective science to back it up. But perhaps the future here is rather than separating people by their sex to separate them by their characteristics as observed to, you know, it's, it's probably the only way we're ever going to actually achieve something like fairness. But um, yeah, I mean, I'd like to think that there would be a future where more trans people would compete and they would compete, compete in a space which is fair and equal and everyone can be comfortable that when the trophies are handed out, everyone is getting a fair deal. Um, I, I don't think that's scaremongering. I just think it's important to bear that in mind that this is gonna be a problem that's gonna repeatedly come up both for trans people and cis people for the foreseeable future, both male, female, and any combination in between. Um, so yeah, I kind yeah. of think that it's, it's an issue that needs to be addressed, but not out of fear, out of looking forwards, is what I'm saying. Fantastic, well, Reshma. Uh, sorry, sorry, John, go on. Sorry, it's just because um, the idea of sport being a level playing field and being fair is bullshit, because essentially, <laughs> even if you've got um, this kind of binary idea of guys and girls, You've got so many different body types within each. How yeah. how do we think of it as being fair? We try to think of it as being fair based on traditional ideas of what women are able to do and what men are able to do. Usain Bolt shouldn't be able to do what he does, being six foot five and running that fast. He's uh, a genetic marvel, uh, essentially. So is Castor Semenya as well. I've had multiple conversations about this today, and we will have those outliers. Um, Reshma, I want to come to oh, you. Just, just to be yeah. very clear, I mean, when you say he is a marvel, then that in itself tells you that he is a one-off. So mm -hmm. you're getting more and more of them, I, I think, personally. Yeah. Um, you're discovering more of them. Um, people are, it's, it's an idea of role models to think, oh, he can do it. And I'm six foot one. Maybe I should focus on being a runner instead of being a typical basketball player and becoming a mediocre basketball player when I could be an amazing runner, but because I only saw shorter than five for 10 and that's the general average, I didn't bother. So that's how I see it as well. Um, I don't know if you want to respond to that, John. No. Okay, Reshma. <laughs> yeah, I'm confused by the whole thing now. There's so many different bits of information there. And um, I think I don't know enough about the the science behind uh, fairness in sports to comment, but it's really interesting, all of it. And just the last point that, you know, that John was making as uh, the thing that he referred to as being BS, that's, that's a very new thought for me. I don't even, um, that almost exploded my head. Like, how do we even think that that's, how did that become the norm in a sense to have these categories? And because I've completely accepted it. Do you know what that's I mean? Right. Hmm. In some respects, Ollie, please go I would, ahead. I would disagree in the sense that, um, I mean, you can say patriarchy, you know, straight out, but I don't think to a degree that's a matter of, um, that's not an insidious or bad thing. 
um, we, we divide, human beings love to divide people into little boxes. This is a thing we've done forever. Um, but in the case of sport, traditionally, we've divided men's sports and women's sports up because it's the best way we knew how. That was the only way we knew how. This is what I was saying before, is that then we discovered, oh, wait, we can look at people's chromosomes. Okay, we'll try and do that. Oh, we can look at their blood chemistry. Oh, we'll do that. The more you learn, the more you realize that, yeah, fairness definitely is bullshit. And I'm totally with John on that one. But that doesn't mean you can't have stratifications. You know, you can't have classes that, that function, um, you know. Again, you know, there's people like Michael Phelps. You know, no one's going to argue about Michael Phelps. The man's built like a fucking dolphin. Like, <laughs> but then the thing is, you can put him as someone with the same, same weight, same height, and he will probably still beat them because of the configuration of his body. But at least you know that if you put him up against someone who's half his weight and half his height, he's definitely going to have a major advantage. Um, but until, as Reshma is saying, the science is complicated. I don't know enough about the science. I'm not sure science knows enough about science to really make these kind of judgment calls. Um, well, that's so the thing that they need to start doing a bit more exploration rather than just letting things be as they are and letting states like Minnesota dictate what happens to a trans individual in terms of their sporting career. Um, hmm. I can I just clarify that the whole idea of Navratilova, just to take us back to that being a focus, we're saying, or rather the, the wider world is saying what it said about Gina Carano and that she's been canceled. And I really don't think that's the case. She's just found a way of plugging what she believes to be um, reality to people who, um, who otherwise wouldn't have known that they could have sided with her, yeah? Like there are turf people now who are um, using what Navratilova said for their own kind of agenda. You know, she streamlined her audience, so to speak. So we shouldn't talk about her as though she has been cancelled, as if she's some kind of victim. If anything, she's just increased a certain amount of attention on a long running idea in sport being something that needs to be um, addressed when it comes to our, our knowledge of the non binary um, variables within it. So, very interesting point it, it, regarding that. Um, and <clears throat> for myself personally when I've looked at sport I've always tried to think of it in, in a way that everyone should be given the chance to compete on a living playing field and it's not necessarily at the elite level I'm talking about mid-tier you know non-professional um to, to give an example if if you are a an athlete that is you know transgender and you are taking away the place of let's say a, 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 a girl, a young girl who would have been on the college team, but because she doesn't come up to the transgender athletes standard, which I know the, the science has said there's no necessary, there's no distinction. But I, I clearly think if someone is six foot tall once again or six foot five and they're playing the netball team, they're going to do a lot better than someone who's technically an average height girl but on an all girls team they're average height but this person has got them to the state championship because they're six foot five but they say that they they identify themselves as a girl what is that going to do to the girl who didn't get on the team she lost out on a scholarship because she couldn't get on the team and this person may have transferred from california to move to a state that is more accepting of, of fluidity and so forth so I ask that question is, once again, on fairness, not talking about elite, I'm talking about the general person, because I personally would not, as a parent, if I was, would not be happy that someone who's technically a boy has come in and potentially ruined my child's future. It's a very niche um, situation. I don't think it's that niche. About. I think it's happening more and more and more all the time. Right. It, you talk about these transgender athletes. Biden has just weighed in on the subject. This is now become larger this has now become a larger topic and it's going state by state it is coming this way okay well as i said it's niche because you're trying to identify what three different factors you're talking about their height then being transgender then being introduced into the idea of doing sports 
um, actually is a four factor, them actually being good. Because even if you are six foot five, I know a lot of people who are quite tall who are shit at basketball, yeah? So can we just keep it real? <laughs> but this is what I said before. If you know you're six foot five, you normally would go for basketball. But if you're six foot five and you know that someone you could run really, really fast in the female race, you might do it. The problem is, again, we're talking about phantoms. Why try and try and sort out a problem which doesn't necessarily exist when you can't really name names or events, or as I said, people winning trophies. If you have like <laughs> two or three people doing really, really well, does that mean that we all go, oh my God, they're taking over? How many transgender people truly exist in the world of sports? Quite a few. Um, I would say Fallon Fox, UFC fighter, has destroyed the straw weight division. Um, there are female female weightlifters who who have transitioned who are destroying the records as well. If you, I, I as a, once again, I am a fan of Joe Rogan, <laughs> which um, and I have he has he's a UFC commentator. He's discussed Fallon Fox a numerous times. Who who has become a champion? Now, I've spoken for way too long, sorry, on, on this. I want to open it up again. But I also want to throw in a question in regards to cancelling and cheating. Lance Armstrong, Live Strong, which was the band that he had, raised over half a billion dollars for his charity. But he was found to be cheating, blood doping, and um, he was cancelled. Okay? But what he did was amazing. Should he be cancelled? Sorry, I know it's two questions. Yeah. But. <laughs> I think, if, if I may, um, there's, there's two, there's, sorry, there's a lot to unpack. There's two things there that I, I want to bring up because I think um, one thing to clarify when you're talking about, because um, maybe this isn't what you're getting at, but what I'm taking away from what you're saying is um, that some, um, some males will sidestep into female sports by transitioning in order to gain a competitive advantage. Um, now that's something that, yeah, it's theoretically possible, but you kind of come back to the old, the good old scare transgender bathroom issue, you know? Okay, sure. But the thing is that I, I don't think that anyone would go put themselves through what trans people go through in order to achieve that. It's not um, fucking worth it. It's not gonna no. happen. <laughs> but it, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to I'd like to start from a place where we assume that everyone is a genuine person competing fairly and that means that yes okay some you know like you say um Fa Fallon Fox is, is that right yeah, um, Fox. yeah I've seen some of those fights and that is it's an awkward situation because you know there are factors of play there but I'm not sure that they would ever have deliberately chosen that path um, in order to win, make those wins, but they are making those wins, and and this is what I'm saying is that the difference. It's one thing to to be concerned about people trying to cheat. I think that's kind of a, like John says, it's a bit of a phantom. It's a phantom Venice to use a term. Um, but oh god, <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> it's a Star Wars reference. Yeah, I <laughs> yes, I liked it. I liked it. Um, but yeah, okay, there are there are issues with the objective issue. Uh, and, and that's something we need to address. The other part I was going to say there with Lance Armstrong, it does interestingly dovetail because obviously Lance Armstrong is on a cocktail of things he shouldn't be in order to push his performance forward. And I think the interesting fact, there's an interesting um, mirror here because to all intents and purposes, um, trans women um, are taking performance debilitating drugs. Um, they are taking... Um, you know things into their body which will reduce their performance overall theoretically again i'm not a scientist and even scientists are slightly on the fence about this one um so it's interesting that it goes in two very different directions but you can try and compare them um i would say just as a sidebar that for lance armstrong using drugs in the cycling competition is basically like having breakfast before you go out in the morning everybody does it we all know it i kind of find myself thinking well it's a damn shame that you know he claimed not to but had he not claimed not to i'd have been like sure um you know and again this is the thing that i think um looking to the future we we have a problem coming up where um technology 
and and biological science is going to get to a point where we're going to have to start asking questions not just about you know is you know is gender fair in sport you know are my enhancements fair are my you know are my life-saving drugs fair you know are my genetic enhancements fair these are all problems we're going to come up against it's where i grew up fair it's where i grew up fair because maybe i had an advantage because i went to a particular school or i could have gone to millfield for example the best rugby school in the world i'd still be five foot six but i might have got into a a team some sort of university team continue i didn't And it's all those type of things that we keep going into. So one of the things I used to say was the purity of Frisbee, the purity of sport. That is the ultimate winner. But other people think differently. Now, Reshma, Alice, I want to open it up to you guys and then potentially we can move on. So where do you think? What do you guys think? Go first, Alice. Okay. Um, I like, yeah, there's a lot to, lot to unpick there, but I'm going to say about Lance Armstrong, um, just because I know he raised so much money for charity with the Live Strong, but was it Live Strong? Is that right? Band. But that doesn't mean he doesn't deserve to be cancelled for taking performance of hands and drugs. I've just learned from Ollie that everyone's doing it. So that's good. You know, maybe he shouldn't have been cancelled then. But at the same time, you know, it was his charity, but it wasn't. It's like that, like it's charity raised that money. And I'm assuming there was a lot of PR and marketing behind that that raised that money. So, yeah, it's fantastic, but it doesn't mean that he can he gets to get out of jail free card. Like, you know, he did a bad thing. He, yeah. So I feel on that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I think that going back to what, Oliver said about objectives, like knowing what the objectives are, and you know, it could be, um, do we have a particular place we're trying to get to in the future? Because we're setting um, the, the the sort of the roadmap for what's going to happen later. So even if, as John said, it's just a few people at the moment that are um, making um, other people so worried and. Um, it might be there's a lot more people in the future. So the decisions we make now will make a, a slightly larger impact later, perhaps. And then also from the perspective of, of council culture, it's also the individual objective. So when somebody um, just, I don't know, tweets on their own personal account and they say something, I don't think that um, we know necessarily that their objective was to create more irrational fear around a a topic, especially something like this. It could also be from a place of ignorance or just misunderstanding. So it goes back to what I was saying earlier as well, that if we really want to um, move society in a particular way, so let's say from this perspective, if you feel someone's not progressive enough, then it it really is about taking the time to explain and make sure it it wasn't just a mistake or an error in judgment. Um, But then of course, there might be other times where they do have an actual agenda, but I think, you know, second guessing um, or assuming that their objective is is a bad one um, is is not, I don't think that's a good thing, especially for, uh, you know, society as a whole. So that's, I think probably all I can say on that. Yeah. I just want to ask a quick question. Um, Who decides the progressive or progressive action is right? Who, Who makes that decision? In regards to, you know, if 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 the vocal majority have said we should do be all inclusive, are they necessarily correct? I think a lot of that comes down to organisations like the IAAF, um, you know, the uh, International Association of Athletic Federations, or, or or groups like that, because in the end, they're the ones making the qualification or disqualification. But the trouble is that then they have to listen to the, you know, the public and, and, and what they say. So it's a fine line to toe. But I guess in the end, they're the ones who are you know, laying down the law and might I add constantly changing it on a yearly basis. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, for my money, I don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in here. Um, the only thing that's ringing on my mind is that I have to kind of repeat what I said before, because I think it hasn't really been challenged or, or really acknowledged. But if you are 
um, the foremost voice in sport for women and LGBTQ rights, and you're recklessly um, asking questions on Twitter, and then those things are called out, and then you come back months later and you double down on that and imply that a whole community um, is under a certain kind of lens because they may they may have more people in there that are more likely to cheat or, or or wantonly you know ruin a sport for another agenda if you're saying all those things knowing how uninvestigative mainstream media is and how they just want to get um a certain um uh, idea of you out there even if that is er eroding that whole community's um, voice you, you have to be more responsible about these things or at least um, own up to how that naivety has contributed to a very toxic um, conversation, which obviously, um, as far as I'm sure you can tell from how I feel, I feel like the majority viewpoint um, has, um, has still got sway, even though, as Ollie's pointed out before, testosterone checking is not scientific. It's not particularly um, uh, just about the trans community. It's about sport in general and how um, sex has not been uh, truly identified in the most uh, uh, nuanced ways in this. I, I just think that Martina Navratilova was incredibly naive and she has not really admitted to how the mainstream media has reappropriated what she was saying. Does she care? I don't think she thinks that she has to care in the way that I'm suggesting that she does. I think mm. that she is kind of blind to all of that. Um, and that is a problem. If you, get a what... amount of, sorry, if you get a certain amount of traction in your career for being a certain way, um, mm. that might blind you to having to listen to other people. She's gone off yeah. and she's come along quite mm. emboldened. There's that article that I shared with you yeah. guys that will be in this um, uh, description Brock was saying mm -hmm. because she's been ostracized from one element of what her community is she's mm -hmm. doubled down in a way that I think is it's just not valuable for the conversation to move forward because she's not accepting <clears throat> that. Uh, just going back to the article that you shared with us there was a point where she mentioned that she left Czechoslovakia to come to the USA so she would have the freedom to express herself so therefore is she not expressing herself and now she's being attacked when she left that country how big was her podium yeah she was she but this takes us back to grand slam, she wasn't the grand slam like you know um tennis star artist then she became after successive victories who she is today and yet she still feels that she can speak without having kind of any kind of editorial um mindset you, you don't have this from politicians. You don't have this from policemen. Why do we have to have it from a sports person? I find it refreshing, but that's just me. Um, anybody else on, on, on this at all? I was just going to say, you know, we're talking about it being naive. You know, she's got a platform. She needs to be really aware of that. And, you know, she should probably own the mistake and say, yeah, yeah, I, like I shouldn't have tweeted that. Like it was a misunderstanding kind of thing. But n like no one's given any of these people being cancelled that opportunity to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, it's the thing. So can we really expect anyone to want to educate themselves? Like, I'm going to say, like, you know, most of us are think would think that way. We would think, let's go out, let's educate ourselves, let's be better people at this kind of thing. But for some other people, we do need to account that if they're attacked and attacked, then they will just go straight into this niche kind of area where they think, well, that's my viewpoint. That's how I feel. I don't know if I'm like misreading it and I'm trying to see the best of that. But at the same time, we're saying she's naive for not realising it, but she's not being allowed to make that mistake due to Twitter, just absolutely jumping on her. I don't know. Like she's got the loudest voice in mm. this community. Yeah, there is no opposite number for Navratilova in terms of how, let's say, because um, they did, if you have Piers Morgan talking about this controversy on the programme called Good Morning Britain, they can only really cite Navratilova. They will never cite someone else's opinion that has the bigger platform. There'll be people who don't agree with her that they will talk to, 
but those people don't have the same megaphone. You know, so let's not suggest that because she's been cancelled, she's got like no room to talk. <laughs> she every time she says anything, the whole world will hear it. That's what her name is. There are people who who never watch tennis who know who she is. Yeah. That's that's power. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, sorry, John. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I was just going to say another thing about J.K. Rowling, but I'll shut up. <laughs> that was interesting. I was going to say that as well, but Ollie, I think you have something there. Oh, good Lord. If J.K. Rowling's coming out of the woodwork, I better get, make this quick. Um, <laughs> one thing I would say, and just to reiterate, because and do correct me if I'm wrong, John, because I think, you know, obviously you've got the stuff nearby. Um, there's a couple of things we didn't address, which is the fact that I believe Navratilova did attempt to apologize she deleted her tweets and then apologized and then got slammed anyway because people were way too into the fun of slamming her so you can't apologize it's kind of what Alice was saying so that that part I have some sympathy for I feel kind of bad um on the other hand some of the things she said um and you could plead ignorance to this as well but I think one thing that needs to be um raised is that um basically she said some stuff which um, for trans Twitter is somewhat the equivalent of like the nuclear bomb. Um, trans issues are, bought, are so complex that they border on a philosophy all of their own. Um, and I say that not lightly. I, I do not ever set foot in trans Twitter because frankly, even as someone who's quite well read on the subject, I don't feel comfortable discussing it because it's so complex. But there are things like trans medicalists, um, or true scum, I hate that word. Um, and some of the things that Navratilova had said were very much in that vein. Clearly, um, you know, something that would, someone would say in ignorance, but it's hard to expect the majority of people to know these things and why they're bad without being extremely educated on the subject. Now, I'm disappointed she wasn't, especially considering she, you know, has a trans coach and all that stuff. But then her coach came out and said pretty much the same stuff. In fact, I was reading the thing that the coach said, and I was like, wow, that seems a little transmedicalist for me. But then again, like I said, they're old school. Um, that doesn't get them, you know, much leeway, but it should get them some, I would hope. Um, and yeah, they, they could be educated on that. But yeah, I, I find it hard to be angry at people who don't understand the complexities and nuance of the subject, because like I say, I the only difference between me and someone on the street is I'm grasping onto it with two fingers instead of one uh, um, so it, it, those are a couple of things that I just wanted to raise because I think they're very important um, and should anyone be interested by that subject um, I would thoroughly recommend looking it up I think we've discussed them maybe privately and I'm not sure on the video we've discussed people like Natalie Wynn of ContraPoints who does an amazing job of explaining some extremely complicated things which um, you know are brain meltingly difficult, which shouldn't be the case if you're trying to describe who you are, but <laughs> it's life, I suppose. Anybody else? Um, you're right. The, uh, just to go to your first point, she did apologize. And I'm not saying that she didn't apologize for certain words or language used, but she didn't seem to be cognizant as to who she is in the media and how what she says has a certain amount of legitimacy for people who are less investigative. And I'm talking about editors of certain newspapers. Um, your latter points um, all pretty much uh, ring true, so yeah. I think the one thing I would just quickly tack onto that is like you say, uh, newspaper editors are not investigative. Um, but the thing is they're not investigative because man, few people have time to <laughs> figure this stuff out honestly if you were a responsible editor at this stage you work for the new york times or something you would have someone on staff who was a bloody expert in this stuff and i believe they do actually so um but for some folks that complication yeah it can be a, a, a minefield some people it can be a trap some people it can be a really useful stick to beat people with um you know not pointing any fingers um but yeah well, the so fact that we both know this the fact that everyone in this room should know this is what's really scary. That if we know that we are reliant in some cases on media to know what's going on in the world, if they're not investigative about certain things that perhaps not everyone um, has had much contact with, uh, whether it be subject matter or peoples, then surely 
Um, if you're a LGBTQ um, uh, activist who happens to be a sports star, you'd maybe like think about what you're fucking saying. I don't know, crazy idea. I don't know. You think that. You would think that, and I don't know if necessarily people do it. I think it's, I'm going to take it back to what Reshma said in our original um, discussion in regards to being part of certain family groups as well, um, and, and where potentially being in a particular religion or a particular sect or so forth, you are infused with certain ideo ideologies, you know, feelings about certain groups, certain types of people, uh, uh, and so forth. And we, as a group, you know, we've taken the time to research and, you know, look into the, the Navratilova case and cancel culture as a whole. And we are a particular cross-section of society, but we're probably not covering a large proportion of the guy who goes to work on the building site or the person who works in the factory. We're, we're not that group at all and I've got to be quite honest with that and if we want to be very progressive and inclusive we have to speak I believe speak to everybody and have these type of subjects that are coming on and have honest conversations and not just tell people this is the way it is uh, as we've said education is huge but some people don't have time for education they've got bills to pay they've got um, you know, kids feed they've got all these type of things. They don't have time to listen to uh, what what is that? They don't even want to watch uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. No reason why they just don't want to watch it because they're not included. They don't care. It's just one of those things. And I'm only you know spitballing, but that's just generally. If I go to Croydon right now, which all of you and most of the viewers know where I'm from, the Navratilova case has never come up. They probably never met anyone from the trans community. If they would, they definitely aren't in their church and a few other bits and pieces as well. So that's my what point. Are, are you saying they're not in Croydon? What are you saying, Simon? I'm they just... are, they are in Croydon, but they're not, they're not going to be going to, they're not going to be going to the church that I, they're not going to be going to the church that the majority of my family have been to. They're not, they're not. Maybe they may not want to identify themselves as trans if they feel that the people around them are not going to put the energy into knowing who they are, but that could be a whole other issue. But you're part of the collective in the end, so maybe we're all part of one family and that's what church is supposed to be, but church is, to me, is one of the most divisive uh, media, uh, divisive platforms that we have out there. Well, that's why I don't go. <laughs> but that, you don't, but I don't know what the percentage is in the UK, but it's decreasing, but there's still a heavy percentage of people going to church in the UK. Sorry, <laughs> once again, anyone else on, on that point? Reshma, we haven't heard from Reshma, you. Reshma, come on, you need to say something. Yeah, go on. <laughs> come on, Reshma. Come on, say something. I just, I don't you know. Did your hair you hair right now? Right now? Oh, you're looking good. Come on, you, can, you haven't just come on the show to smile. <laughs> <laughs> you all have very good points, and... Um, you're all coming from quite different perspectives and I just noticed how this is potentially a very heated discussion so I understand where Oliver is coming from because at the beginning I didn't I don't think I appreciated that quite so much um okay so firstly I agree with Simon that there are a lot of people that are not exposed to this dialogue and because John you're you're very exposed to this dialogue and you have you know you're very this is very personal to you so it's it might be difficult for you to realize that there are a lot of people that have never even thought about this topic ever so it's very fresh for them when they first have to think about it and it's going to take them a while to to make decisions about what, what they think before they can even speak on it so, so I, I, am, I agree with Simon in that regard. I'd say if you went back 10, 15 years and you said that, I'd be like, all right, fair enough. But in 2021, you haven't thought about the trans community ever? Hmm. I'm a little bit mystified. You may have thought about it, but you made your decision and moved on. Mm. I think there's that's five people here and two people are telling you that and you're refusing to accept it. What does that say? We can't use this as a barometer of like the entire like galaxy. 
sexy. I mean, can we? Can we really? Well, no, but we're using it as um, a barometer for this room. All right, you're good. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can I just really like just a bit more like pointed? Because I'm being quite facetious in some areas, I suppose, because I find it um, it's a heavy subject, but I suppose dealing with the the inherent like moments of like comedy within us talking about it helps us process it. Simon, you're saying that that we have to look out for the common person who may not have thought about this. Yeah, not is necessarily the, the common, not necessarily the common person. I'm just thinking the person who generally isn't interested. Uh, they could be common. They could be uh, in a different country. We're, we're, we're all working towards a progressive society on a global scale. I feel not just in the UK, not just in the, where I think on the global scale, it's going to take time, okay? And just because us five together have said, you know, we, we slightly disagree, but three of us are saying maybe we should go this way and two of us are saying maybe we should go a different way. If you translate that to the entire world, there's so many different opinions of people saying, I think it should be this way. Who is right? Who, who, who is right in the end? That, that, that's my question. Um, Ollie, I think you were going to say something off the back of me. John, you might want some time to think. I can see, <laughs> I can see you there. Um, there. Well, there were two points there. Um, I, I think one is just that um, I think it harkens back to maybe some conversations that I maybe raised on Rambox in various subjects um, about, you know, responsibility and the responsibility to know. You know, you have the power to know anything that humankind knows at any time of the day or night but you are now responsible for doing that. So if you as the man on the street, your average, sorry, Middle England voter from, you know, Cleethorpes on Grimes BC, you know, you need to, you know, you owe it to yourself and everyone in your community to learn, but that doesn't necessarily mean everyone will. That's an ideal world. Um, I think if, the, if, if, think if everything from 2016 has taught us everything, is that not enough people stop and, and, you know, take a minute to think like, Simon was saying they make their mind up they see two facts they move on they've got things to do and that's a shame but that is the human condition I think the other thing I was going to address is that um without taking it to too personal a place um you know where I'm at the venerable age of 34 for the short foreseeable future and as a teenager the trans issue literally walked up and smacked me square in the face um you know I had no choice but to investigate this whole thing um, you know, for various reasons. Um, and even as someone who had to, you know, figure it all out and go through the process and, and educate myself on the subject, even I'm still learning. I mean, there's stuff I've learned this week where I was like, man, I wish someone had raised that with me before. Cause man, if I know now I was a teenager, that would have been a lot easier. So I think that, yeah, okay. The world is moving on and, and yeah, this is a question that's being asked now, but you know, even the people who are in it, as I'm, it seems you and I are, you know, it's such a deep subject that, you know, it's hard to, to know, you know, exactly everything that you need to know. Um, you know, the absolute understanding requires absolute knowledge and none of us have that, clearly. Um. Okay, John, I mean, you, I, you know, We've all responded, said our piece. Um, before I think we move on to the next subject, I want to just you know, come back to you in regards to, you know, maybe what, from what you've heard, how do you feel? What, what, do you have anything else to add to it? Um, not really, no. Um, I think that mm -hmm. there's a lot to be said in that we wanted to talk about how Navratilova's situation um, found us going down the route of talking about um, say the transgender community and whatnot bearing in mind that none of us as far as I know identify as transgender um, thus us talking about it is maybe um, has like a few maybe uh, say peripheral kind of like issues in itself but I mean we couldn't help but do that I guess um, and when it yeah, comes down to I, it, we I shouldn't be excluded. Sorry, we shouldn't be excluded from talking about Sorry. it. We shouldn't be excluded from talking about it at all. I don't think. I think everything is up for 
nuanced discussion you know and you know asking questions just as i've always said like a child they ask the right questions they constantly ask questions because they don't understand and they're, and they're constantly developing we into our 60s 70s 80s 90s should still be asking questions because we don't know everything as ollie just said we've got access to all the information but what do we really store what, what, what we only have so much uh, SED memory storage in, in our brains uh, before biases take over, um, nature versus, you know, the nature of who we are as an individual, you know, our experiences as well, you know, to be, I don't know exactly what happened to Ollie, but it may have, you know, framed your, 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 your certain ideas about the community and this can happen on lots of different things in regards to society as a whole I feel because and maybe this is where when we get into cancel culture and people are triggered emotionally it's because of something that has happened in their life that has either pushed them one way or the other or they sit in the middle and uh, but we don't really hear about the people in the middle who want to sort of discuss it we just hear about the two sides who go to war with each other over lots and lots of different subjects and then in some respects one side wins out and the other side is suppressed i i feel simon maybe you've misunderstood me i mean i feel comfortable talking about cancel culture in relation to Navratilova yeah. and in doing so we will talk about certain aspects of the transgender community. My mm. only issue is that if you really think about it there are far more talking heads who happen to be outside of that community who seem to have platforms that are therefore right. going to impress their views. So that's what I'm saying. That has Sorry. to be acknowledged. I, my, I think my speaker cut, cut out but um, I, I feel very impassioned on this today. <laughs> once again we can talk about this for ages and what i want our viewers to do is to have a discussion with you know their, their their people closest to them maybe have a conversation with someone who you aren't as close with and see their thoughts as well um because this is a subject the council culture subject is a subject that is becoming as i said right at the beginning of this whole series i feel is becoming more prevalent and the panel and i have taken some time to look at cases of cancel culture where um or the phrase cancel culture people have been cancelled in the, the field of academics um now i want to come to alice first who's just gonna give us a quick overview of a particular uh, issue a situation um and then we will respond and then we'll continue with that after and we'll do that for a while please alice go ahead Okay, so the case that I thought was particularly interesting was um, Michael Persinger, who was a professor of psychology at La Laurentian, I hope I'm saying that right, university. Um, and he was basically, he was cancelled due to the use of excessive profanity and homophobia and inflammatory language, shall we say. So basically what, the, what happened was, was um, this professor runs a psychology class he's a psychology professor and he gave out consent forms to students saying i'm going to be using um expletives in class like um swear words and slurs um and he had legit like like legitimate pedagogical reasoning behind this he teaches psychology he was trying to show them what language like how it can produce emotional responses in people Alice, and can then, I just quickly ask, what does pedagogical mean, just for everybody? Um, teaching. It's a teaching reason. They basically had a reason for doing it. He wasn't just doing it just to kind of seem like he was cool. He was doing it for a spe specific reason in his classes to invoke responses in his students. And as a psychology professor, he's trying to show them, you know, language has power, all these type of things, and showing them about... Um, the reason behind that basically and he's never um he's always he's done this class for a while and this in in the 2015 people started complaining about it and then he was transferred to a different faculty and cancelled basically because of this and for me i did a bit of research on it and i found a quote from him 
which said um, it's a tremendous recruitment tool. Students enjoy the fact that it says restricted on the top. So if you're thinking about that from like a retention and an attention grabber perspective, then he's got the kind of attention straight away. It's a bit different. And you've got to bear in mind going into college, a lot of these students are going to come from school where they don't really get that in lessons. So it's probably interesting for them. And then he goes on to say, what they like about the class is they can ask any question they want, no matter how politically incorrect. And we discuss it in a rational way, using data more than emotional arguments, um, more than political correctness and more than just social agendas. So he's allowing that kind of opening of rhetoric between people to be able to go on and educate themselves and get um, like change their opinions on stuff. So I thought it was very interesting that he'd been cancelled. Fantastic. Um, Reshma, I would like you to please respond to that. Yeah. With regards to cancel culture and the word just when we say cancelling, does that really apply to to this sort of a situation? Am I misunderstanding the definition of cancel culture, just first of all? And and, and then secondly, sorry, and also, if in what way was... Was he cancelled, Alice? Like, what do you mean? What happened? So he was basically, he, his class was taken away from him. He wasn't allowed to run the class anymore. He, like, his name's been smeared kind of thing, you know. It's just, he sort of had his reputation taken away from him for a reason where I'm kind of thinking, was it that legitimate? Is the more important things out there? Who cancelled him? Um, it was the oh, yeah. students. The students. So yeah. in regards to council culture, I think this does apply. I okay, think so... it definitely applies. This is where it does apply more than any other case that we've discussed so far, because unlike Gina Carano or J.K. Rowling or Navratilova, how does this person move on to another educational establishment if their previous job has this tarnish? So this person actually has my... Um, my sympathies more than the others, to be honest. Okay. Reshma, <laughs> please. Now, I understand. Um, when we do things that um, people don't like in our jobs, then, you know, they have the right to complain and then we can address it. Um, that's always been the case. If you do something, you're going to maybe come under some kind of scrutiny and... Um, it has to be addressed in the right way. I think there are procedures in place within an education establishment as to how to go about it. And um, you can't sort of just fire somebody. I think that there's there are there are procedures, as I said. So um, if that was done properly, then he would have to have responded and and explain what he was actually doing and what he was trying to achieve. And then a board would look at it. So I, I don't really know the ins and outs of what happened there. But with regards to students feeling empowered within this current climate to be able to just say, I don't like this, get rid of this person. I think that's definitely a problem. And um, that scares me actually. Quite dangerous. Anyone else has anything to say on this point? John? Wouldn't it be just as scary? Yeah, hi. Wouldn't it be just as scary to have a situation where, um, certain things were going on in the classroom, but the students didn't necessarily have the power to do anything about it because of the power imbalance that can normally happen between students and staff. Isn't it more a case of us looking at it as a case by case basis here, rather than being afraid of this one case being symptomatic of a, a need again for us to be afraid of council culture? Alice, can you just remind me, when did this t case take place? Uh, 2015. 2015 okay um and i think all of us have obviously gone through the document and i believe there are 131 examples maybe more examples of of these type of um uh, cases over the course and they're not slowing down at all now maybe i i may be scaremongering and uh, maybe but i i as i've always said i am kind of worried of people utilizing people's fear of potentially being guilty or seeming wrong um to not be prepared to just stand up and say what they want to say 
if, if we are in the position where we're offering freedom of speech, yes, you also could have the freedom to be punched in the mouth as well. That is also what can potentially happen. But I'd rather live in that society than always being scared that someone's going to be filming me or someone's going to be, you know, take offense to potentially what I say without knowing any context or, you know, just overhearing what I've said and then sending it to someone and going, oh, well, they said this, da, da, da. As we took back in the first episode, whistleblowing as well, call in culture. That's the way I want to go. I want to people to have no fear to come up to myself or anyone else and say, hi, I heard this. I don't like it. This is the reason why, rather than running off to Twitter, running off to the school board. Okay, the schools are slightly different because obviously you adhere to a certain set of rules, but we are seeing more and more cases of teachers uh, Zoom calls being recorded. There was the the interview with Diane Seegers, which I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago, of a, I believe, a one-on-one Zoom call. The um, other person didn't report it somehow it was uploaded onto the school intranet left up there for a couple of weeks and then someone decided to you know record it and the student sent it to the board and that person lost their job i feel there's issues there all over the place but people may disagree with me um does anyone else have anything to say on that i think there's one thing i i just want to make a quick clarification um from from a purely sorry it's a slightly abstract point but um as you're saying that obviously there is a place where free speech can turn into a punch in the mouth but um that's not true um in fact your freedom in a liberal society and the freedom of your fist ends at someone else's nose that is the rule so in some respects you don't have to worry too much about that um okay <laughs> okay i'll have a look into it <laughs> it's just it's it's a point that i need to raise because i think it's one thing that people use as a lever in this debate um the idea that people's one person's liberty in a free society can overreach and impress upon another's is not true in fact that's kind of the market where it starts to go wrong and we all have the freedom to do things as long as they don't infringe upon the freedom of others which is kind of what you're getting at with you know who's who's right to raise this point um you know probably i imagine the school board of the people who are in trouble um are the ones who have to make that decision because they're the only ones equipped for the information you know the position and uh you know and the wherewithal to do it as long as they're informed and they don't just do it out of public pressure i think you know that's the main thing and often that can happen i i from what i've seen is that once the wider public does get a hold of these things school boards have made decisions uh, in regards i think in the case of the one i just mentioned they'd known about it for weeks there have been calls from the students about this particular professor and they'd done nothing about it until this was leaked and then they went oh we're going to terminate you Mm. um so I would like to go back to Ollie. <laughs> um, I believe you have a, a, a case that you'd like to talk about. Yeah. S- sorry, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so uh, there's a couple and it's, it's hard to really choose because some of them, these come to me in real life. And actually there's one on the list that particularly jumped out at me because it's something that I've actually had to debate in real life a few times. There's a gentleman called Timothy Jackson from the University of North Texas. Um, there's a bit of a shaggy dog story to this one. It's a music related thing, which is very much in my ballpark. Um, basically to cut a long story short, the basis of Western music theory, it com- comes under the sort of, is sort of originates somewhat with a gentleman called Heinrich Schenker. Um, he comes from a period of time, which you might call problematic. Um, but his analysis of music theory and the way that is used to break down music has become the standard for all music study throughout the world. Um, there's an excellent video on this um, by Adam Neely on YouTube. I thoroughly suggest everyone goes watching it because even if you're not a musician, it's actually fascinating. Um, but the idea is that there is another gentleman by the name of Philip Ewell of Hunter College. I had to read that. Um, who made the point that Schenker's interpretation of music theory is inherently uh, white supremacist. Um, 
And then he goes a little bit further and says that it's racist. Um, it's a very long document. It's kind of very borderline and difficult to read, but the video that he interviewed that he performs with Adam Neely, um, who's very informed music theory wise and an excellent commentator, he dials it back. But there is an element where Yule's analysis is somewhat correct. Um, you know, music theory and the way we approach music is somewhat Western white orientated. Um, now, unfortunately, Professor Jackson um, is a professor in Shankarian analysis of music. Um, and he did not like this at all. He, um, he writes for the Journal of Shankarian Studies, which is not a widely circulate, circulated document, I admit. Um, but he refutes this entire thing. And so obviously, a lot of people who probably never heard of Shankar in the first place got a hold of this, decided this guy maybe was trying to apologize for a racist. Um, um, when in fact, depending on how you read his refutation, could be interpreted that way, but could also be interpreted as it's just a good way of doing things. Um, but, you know, without wanting to take too much of one side or another, um, people who weren't really involved in the whole process, who probably never heard of Heinrich, um, jump on this whole thing. And because of this, this gentleman has been terminated from his job. And also there's a petition for the dissolvement of the document of Shankirian studies, um, which is pretty extreme considering i mean again this is you know somewhat similar to our you know uh, founding fathers with slaves or our winston churchill wasn't such a nice guy routine yeah okay sure um and yeah okay maybe these things are institutionally favoring one kind of music one ethnic background over another but does that mean the guy has to get fired because that's his specialty i don't know it's difficult to say um Ah, that is an interesting one, and I would like to pass this to John. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was interested in like story time with Ollie. I didn't know I had to be part of it. Fucking hell! Um, <laughs> should he be fired because he is an expert in something which is being deemed cancelable? That seems wrong. Um, I, I don't really agree with that. You know, like. What else is there to say? It's, it seems to be a situation where you have to have one over the other. And if I have to choose, then I'd say don't, don't cancel him. Um, but I mean, I've only just found out about this. So should I really even be fucking saying anything? Move on. Thanks, Simon. But no thanks. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, I have nothing to say, uh, generally, uh, other than what might get me in trouble. And just how I related to, but does anyone else have anything? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay, can I ask Oliver, how did it come to public knowledge? Do you know? Um, I believe it began with a plenary address by this gentleman, um, Philip Ewell. But actually, I think it really came to the public attention by the Adam Neely video that I mentioned. That's how I first came about it. It's a video with many millions of views. And to be honest, he did put a pretty clickbait title on it at first, and it really took off. I think it, it had a very strong reaction from a lot of musicians, that's for sure. Um, because it's basically saying, hey, your job's racist. <laughs> um, you know, if you watch the first four minutes of the video, if you watch the 25 minutes, you come out, they're going, yeah, good point. All right, mate. yeah, well made. Um, but yeah, I mean, personally, I, I feel like you will maybe does go a bit too far, um, but I'm not a professor, so I don't want to commit to that. Sorry, if I diverge from the point, carry on, Rishma. No, no, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, because I think um, this does come down to to the to, to objective once again. It seems as though um, his objective was to to use that to to gain some popularity and to create an argument, which is fine, um, because this kind of stuff happens a lot to win favour and things. And I think if Matt was here, I think he'd be able to talk about it from a you know a marketing perspective, you know, because we we sort of there's always a, there's a scramble for content like a lot so if there isn't any find something and you know that's we've had that from way back as well when um editors you know are always looking for a good story and sending their reporters out you know just just find a story anything and it's a story because yeah, I mean, we're talking about it now you know but uh, which is fine but with regards I, i'm with john on you know of course he he shouldn't i don't think he should lose his job over it because that's obviously 
I, that's not how education works. And if we really want to be educated, we have to be able to, to dialogue and we have to be able to look at the, the, the history of things and um, the context of things and be able to share different opinions without getting upset and without people losing their jobs. Unless they are hurting people genuinely, then we can look into that as, as you said, the school board would do that or, you know, we have procedures in place for it. But with regards to just punishing people Willy nilly, which is kind of like what I felt reading that document of 130 odd uh, cases. I, I I was very depressed after. Yeah, we'll have a link to that document in the description box because, as I said before, the people there have my sympathy. Like their lives will be completely transformed due to the binary elements of this culture. Um, but yeah, that's it really. Alice, anything on that at all? No, I just think, uh, yeah, all the arguments very interesting. Um, I agree, the document is quite depressing reading. It seems like there is people being cancelled on either side of the band. It doesn't really matter what you say. Mm -hmm. If you're arguing for something, you know, that's it. People don't like it. If you're arguing against something, people still don't like it. So I recommend reading it. If you want to be sad, I'll say that one. <laughs> uh, I definitely, yeah, uh, I haven't had a chance to, but uh, it might be some good uh, bedtime reading because I need to go to bed to sleep very quickly these days. Uh, <laughs> but um, it, it, something just popped into my head, and I know we don't do it, but it, it kind of takes me back to the likes of, was it Gucci? Who, no, no, no. So Mercedes pr produced... Um, vehicles for the nazis and there was certain um there was a particular designer who did the uh now and, and it kind of leads me back to and i hate talking about him r kelly i've had these conversations with people and i'm like will i ever watch listen to his album again yeah i will listen to i wish i will listen to the and and these type of things and should we cancel you know, everything that a person has particularly done because they were associated with something that was particularly bad. So I really want to go back to, sorry, I went off the arcade because it's just sitting there, but I want to go back to Mercedes Benz. And was it Gucci or was it someone else who designed the uniforms? I know Let's this and I can't remember. We know and we put like, you know, the words are on the screen now. Yeah, it will be, be there. Know. We, we, be there. we know, we know, <laughs> but... Because I think it comes up in one of the movies as well, and and uh, they they do state that <laughs> why are you still around? <laughs> you should have been off, like cancelled years ago because you profited from a horrible, horrible, which is generally agreed the worst atrocity of all time. But they they still continue to thrive. I tell you what, the old Mac good horse that is the conversation of art versus the artist will rear its head on this yeah. video channel so we'll, we'll bring that old mare out of the barn at some point <laughs> so we will don't do don't worry about it now it's it's in the barn it will come out of the barn soon <laughs> not a problem not a problem um so if no one has anything to respond to my general i don't brain fart for a second uh <laughs> what i want to throw in is <laughs> We could talk about association, like that's, if that's someone it, yeah. basically does something really horrendous, like Marilyn Manson, and then someone wants to work with Marilyn Manson, I, I don't know, on a new PR campaign or whatever, mm -hmm. does that person become counsel as well? Yeah, so, so, yeah, we are seeing that. What do you guys think? I think if, uh, I think the one thing I would say is if you're, for instance, a PR agency, no one calls you because they're having a really good time. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, with my expectation with my experience with limited though it may be with the advertising and PR world you know like with some things you go into that job expecting to come out can and not smelling of roses because that's your job when it comes down to another artist well yeah you're in trouble you know that that, that operates on on both sides and yeah it's it's hard to call um you know, I think we mentioned very briefly the lost profits effect. Um, you know, Simon's talking about, you know, R. Kelly. Um, you know, there was a band which I really enjoyed as a teenager named Lost Profits. Uh, the singer did some stuff which I'm not going to mention. Um, and it was so horrendous that I can't even divorce that from, from you know, from their art, 
whether I want to or not. It's it's very tough. But yeah, again, we'll 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 drag this horse out of the barn later. Um, I um, think there's sorry, Karen. No, no, go on, go on, go on. Uh, well, okay. There's one thing I wanted to add before we close up, which is that um, I think a lot of stuff on this list. As I was going down the list, I think it really fascinates me that the one thing we don't have um, really in society, because I'm sure we have a Merriam-Webster definition, but we don't have a societal definition of what constitutes racism or sexism or xenophobia. Um, we have a rough idea of what they may be in a sort of parable way, but we don't really know what they, no one has ever said, okay, this is the formal point at which something becomes racist. I personally have thought about this because that's the kind of thing I get up to in my off time. But, um, you know, there's some things, uh, there was a second example that I was going to bring if we had time, but I won't do it now. There's a professor in Chinese, um, and there's, a, there's words in Chinese and words in Korean which sound like the N word. And, you know, you end up with things like Korean records being beeped out because they say the Korean word for I or you. And it sounds a lot like the N word, you know, things like that. Is that racist? No. <laughs> Do people react and think it's racist? Yes. <laughs> it's it's hard to um, really figure out what in, in societal circumstances, what constitutes racism. And so if someone does something which isn't racist, but people might think it's racist, they get fired. And there's no one to say, well, look, these are the rules. That's not racist. There's no one to stand up for that. There's no sort of arbiter of these things. And I find that fascinating in this whole depressing list that I'm like, not racist, not racist, not racist, not racist. The people raising these petitions are idiots. <laughs> you know? like, yeah, tough call. I vote Oliver the, the arbiter. <laughs> Please don't vote yeah. the arbiter <laughs> racist. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that did just come to mind is um, when I, I was sent something about jerk chicken being translated to Chinese, and it was uh, chicken that is unreasonable, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some point. so that that is one thing um so guys i had one <laughs> i had one uh point which i think kind of touches the point on all, everything that we said and including in regards to the definition of racism so uh, back in november 2020 there was a law professor called uh, diane klein who uh, was at a faculty uh, senate meeting and said that she would assassinate uh, JND uh, Sadaya, and she is the assistant dean of the entire university um, at Laverne Law School as well. Now, Klein is white, Sadaya is black, okay? Um, and Klein has said that Sadaya's leadership was contributing to the academic weakness of many of the law school's graduates as reflected by their low uh, passage rates, which is something I brought up in another. Uh, uh, conversation as well in regards to people being quite frank. Now, this comment was perceived as racist, and um, Sada went to, so Jediah, sorry, went to the HR and said that Klein was practicing a character assassination rather than, you know, forcibly trying to shoot her or anything of that nature. Um, now, I will come back to why I thought that was interesting, generally because I didn't read on much further until I came back to it. But Klein was accused uh, by the administration of, Klein accused, sorry, the administration of racializing a non-racial comment, which I thought was interesting. She was placed on unpaid leave. She was stripped of her tenure and she was fired in both the uh, California State Court and also the National Labor uh, relations board there was a vote by the tenure board to reinstate her but it was ignored by the university um now to go on she she provided a uh, sort of a transcript of what she discussed with with the board uh, on 21 pages um, and i got this from the fix uh, website she told the board um, to put it bluntly the administration is taking you to sentence me asking you to sentence me to an academic death penalty if you do that you'll will be ending my career here or anywhere forever a career dedicated to anti-discrimination law and to educating lawyers of color 
the university spokesperson said Professor Klein had engaged in both sustained and severe affirmative misconduct of a kind that jeopardizes the university's ability to, to carry out his mission. I oh, issued yes, messed up before, and this was the final straw. However, what was found was standard procedure in regards to stripping over a title had not been found, and this is the University of Law. So I think they're going to be pretty clued up on precedent and things like that. <laughs> so the reason why I found this particularly interesting is when I originally heard that the, the opening part of the case, and as you know, we get a slight excerpt, the way I saw it was that Jedia, the dean, assistant dean of the university, had brought a case of this person is trying to assassinate me. I think this is on race, this is on racist grounds. But actually, it was a complete reverse. And until I actually spoke to my mum, who saw it from a completely different angle when I explained it to her, I had already made my mind up. I had already made my mind up. But it's only after sleeping, think, think about it, sleeping and everything else. I sit in the middle. I feel there's been transgressions and I think there's been issues in regards to the, 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 the board trying to get rid of this person because she's troublesome. But also there is history there and maybe this person should have been serving um, or, or being a professor as well. But going back to what we've said in many cases, professors, university isn't necessarily like school. We are going to have some radical thinkers and some of them to me have been my best professors because they've made me think outside the box, not telling me you have to think like this. It's think for yourself make your own decisions, make your own choices. If you think you heard something like um, the M word in Ollie's case, why would a professor just come out and start saying that? Why don't you go do the research? As you say, we have the options to educate ourselves. So guys, I wanna open that up once again. I want to come back to Reshma, if you could. <laughs> no, okay. Is anyone got anything to say on this case, either what I thought, how I reacted, or generally the case as it is because of so many misdemeanors? Alice, maybe as a teacher, <laughs> sorry to be on the spot. Um, I, I was thinking along the same lines as you at first when you were talking about, you know, is, is it racist? Like, is she gone in specifically with um, race? But then, like you said, there's been other things in the past, you know, maybe she is a member of staff who has said stuff not on the record previously and it's kind of an open secret that she might have them views and they were just looking for a reason to get rid of her like we we don't know the full context there so it's very difficult to kind of comment too much I think yeah it, it always is and I, I spent mm -hmm. the last sort of day just spinning it around in my head and I still don't know uh, anyone else I suppose the, oh, sorry John Carry on. No, 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 go on. I was just going to say to summarize, um, there's a very good quote uh, absolute justice requires absolute knowledge. Um, that is the, the case here. You know, the, the more knowledge you have, the more just you can be. But Twitter don't know shit. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> so, what justice can they perform? None. Uh, the, the thing is, Twitter isn't involved in this one. No, no. I, sorry, I, 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 yeah, but. Really, <laughs> But no, I, really I, I, I get what you mean. I get yeah, exactly yeah. what you mean because normally, if this to get on Twitter, oh my days! I they may have acted like I did. John, please. Um, just kind of taking cue from Ollie, really. Essentially, why are you going back into my brain, Ollie, and saying stuff that I'm going to say? It's just freaking me out. <laughs> <laughs> Even though this isn't like a Twitter-like case, we're in danger of treating that situation in the same way that without enough context it's not really easy to truly talk about it you know um that that's how i feel about it at the moment um i mean it is uh, in all of these cases because uh, maybe you like me i scanned all of them um and i chose the juiciest one to to bring to the table um and i actually filtered by termination rather than pending or petition or anything because uh, uh, find the person who's get the job back but maybe this is how once again the media works we've mentioned this many times they take the most sensational 
snippets of a particular story, plaster that all over the headline, get people angry and watch everyone fight about it on Twitter or Facebook or wherever it may be. Um, and well, that's generally- the problem, isn't it, really? If yeah. it's open in that way, just to sell stuff. I mean, the case that Alice brought up, it, I feel that there was enough background there for me um, that was, was communicated for me to feel comfortable talking about it. Um, and that's maybe the thing about cancellation culture. It's not as clear. It's just we, you know, someone's headline, the document cancelled academics and this, and we've taken run with that. But, you know, obviously there's so much more. It's a complicated subject once again. Reshma, you look like you want to throw something into the, onto the table. Is there anything there? No, I'm just, I was, I was actually very confused by that case. And so I really would love to have, added something to it but I must it's you know do you remember last week I asked you to repeat things quite a few times yeah and I just no. don't want to do that to you again so it's just I, I think I I want to actually look at that case very carefully that was really interesting but I just like John said I, I can't I don't feel qualified to comment on it right now please okay uh, I'm so sorry I hope you forgive me for that no 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 uh, sometimes it's me I, I know my mind can go a million miles now and I start chatting about lots of different things so what we will do for the panel and for everyone uh, watching we will put the link to the the fix article below um in in the comments so you have a chance to read all of our cases uh, as well um if if everyone's okay with that yeah is it um yeah that's great is it possible to get because we got ollie's opinion of it um but i'd like to know what everyone else thinks about cancellation via association because that's an aspect of cancel culture that I think if we don't really cover that before we end, then, you know, I'll, I'll go and buy a comb. That's, that's what will happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I know my... <laughs> sorry, sorry, you sorry. Can. <laughs> I, I think I put my point across a couple of episodes ago when I was mentioning about not necessarily J.K. Rowling, but the Scottish children's author who stood by J.K. Rowling's tweet and then she lost her book deal. Um, I don't like that. I think that's a horrible, horrible um, after effect of someone who is, someone who's J.K. Rowling has got escape velocity. Whatever happens, they're not really going to be affected. People are still going to go to Harry Potter world and, and she gets her royalties. But it's the people who have, you know, stood by her potentially worked on her films worked on anything else i think i mentioned harvey weinstein films miramax um at the time miramax as a studio is suffering immensely because of his actions and people knew about it people are complicit in what that that person has done over the years but can you really blame the grip boy that worked on matrix 4 or the the lighting guy can you really but now they're going to lose their jobs and they're going to be tainted with the fact that you know oh you work for miramax Mm, okay in that case it could be it might not be i haven't spoken to anyone but that's generally how i feel please anyone else stop me from ranting you're in the um, right yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, true. You're in the right place, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny uh, from, whenever. I, yeah, sorry. Go, go, on, go, go, on. go, go. No, no, no. All, all I was going to say is that it's funny that I tell whenever I explain it to uh, Rabbox to anyone, I say it's ironic. There isn't a lot of ranting, but there feels to be a lot more this week. I, I don't know. Maybe I've had more sleep. I don't know. <laughs> Let's go, <laughs> Alice. Please. That's <laughs> what we need. We all like a rant. Um. For me, cancellation by association, again, it just goes back to the context of the situation. Like, if someone is, like, I'm thinking Madeline Manson, you know, um, I think if you choose to work with them at this point, then that that's on you. If you are cancelled as a result of that, you know what situation you were getting into with that. But, again, it's like if you think about the context of some of the um, academics on this list, you know, they're going to have that kind of, like, people like the guy who I was talking about, um, Press a Passenger, you know, he's going to have that title on him there that he was cancelled, he got um, all kinds of shit, basically, just because of language. Um, and he's going to, and, like, people who work with him, people who agree with him are still going to get that label. And, if you, like, for me, 
not as serious as some of the other things that are going on in the world. So um, that's just how I feel on that one. Yeah. And I, I think that um, guilty by association, that's a really good question, actually, um, John. I think that we should be allowed to associate with whoever we want to be without actually being labeled as the same, because otherwise we're encouraging sort of tribalism and um, in a bad way, I think, because then, it, you know, it, we get that the us and them dichotomy, which I'm really against. So it's, I think it's nice to be able to get to know people and associate with people who think differently. And if they make mistakes, they make mistakes. And we, when we make mistakes, we make mistakes. But if we create a culture of sort of just judging people and then abandoning ship when they do something we don't like, I, I think that that's horrible. <laughs> Um, can I ask, would there be any exceptions? I mean, let's say you're running a, a YouTube channel that is to do a political discussion and Nick Griffin basically decides that he wants to come on the programme. Do you say, hey, Nick, I'm so glad you've arrived because I'm willing to deal with everybody and anybody and it's cool because I don't believe in tribalism. You can have 45 minutes to discuss your very nuanced new, um, ideas about what this country needs to do in regards to immigration. Do you Par work with Nick Griffin? Parlor's over there. Go go to Parlor. Don't don't use YouTube or whatever. <laughs> that that's my point uh, in regards to it. And actually, being serious, yes, I would let Nick Griffin have his forty-five minutes. If you do not hear what the opposition has to say, you learn nothing. I'd like to know what you don't know about Nick Griffin, Simon. <laughs> I know more about Peter Griffin. Germany. Uh, no, uh, being facetious once again. Um, I know a lot about Nick Griffin. Well, no, I know enough of what I've been told as a minority person. I know a lot about Nigel Farage. I know a lot about the Daily Mail, as <laughs> Ollie keeps mentioning, um, because um, I was brought up in a household that she, she will hate me for saying this, but we did get the Daily Mail on Sunday every single day. But my parents said to me, I read this because I want to know what the other side or other side, you know, the, the people who aren't us are saying about us. Because when it comes to me being on the street and having a discussion, an altercation, I can diffuse people quickly because I already know what they're going to say. And that and knowledge is power for me. So if I don't know what Nick Griffin, Nick Ferrari, uh, the likes of I'm LBC, all over James O'Brien is going to say I just get angry I get emotional but I don't want to defeat people with emotion not defeat <laughs> I'm not Sith or Jedi sorry I don't I'm gray I'm a gray I'm a gray Jedi I'm a gray Jedi I'm a gray Jedi like Ray at the end of the films say what you want don't at me <laughs> um, but I, I think there's both sides and Sorry, going back to, you know, all of those individuals, I want to know what they're saying because they, as we go back to saying a platform, they have a platform. They're followed by a lot of people. Ben Shapiro, Candice Owens, uh, Jordan Peterson, like I mentioned last week. And I think I came across as wrong, not to say that I necessarily, <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with them all. And I've, I've learned from what we discussed last week, it's a matter of opinion and how you look at the facts. However, other people look at the facts and other people look at those opinions and only hear those opinions. And for me to be able to have discourse, dialogue with people, I need to know multiple sides, not just my own. I don't think anyone's going to like, you know, challenge on that, but I definitely think that Nick Griffin's point of view um, hasn't changed much over the years that he's unfortunately been on the planet. But hey, maybe it has updated. Maybe like, you know, various different outlets haven't like told us more about that jaundice way of seeing um the british isles but i i'd severely doubt it but once again that is your opinion what about the people who put the bmp into or whatever it is now into a particular position where we are listening to them ollie i know you want to get in there with that but i just need to throw that in there <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry, I saw your hand go up. No, no, I was, 
Well, I was scratching my head, but um, no, I mean... <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> that's okay. To be honest, I, I was swelling something around in my mind, a couple of things. Um, I think one was the fact that we're saying, okay, like, you know, can you have anyone on your show and worry about them, you know, being unpleasant or, you know, saying things you don't want? Well, to paraphrase the immortal words of Captain Malcolm Reynolds, there isn't anyone they built a statue of that isn't some kind of son of a bitch or another. Um, so you kind of expect you should expect people to be human and, and to have human flaws and be wrong about some stuff, maybe wrong and right about other stuff. Um, but then again, you know, it's funny we mentioned Nick Ferrari and Nigel Farage. I've seen interviews with Nigel Farage where he sat down with a television interviewer in a coffee shop and just acted like a normal human being for like 20 minutes. And I'm like, this guy seems reasonable. He seems cool. Like, it seems like an educated, very pretty eloquent kind of guy. How does he walk off and be such an ass? Because <laughs> <laughs> so, he puts the work in. He doesn't know. Intelligence, <laughs> intelligence can do that to you as well. Don't let any of these people fool you. I know. <laughs> it's like, are you, is he A, fooling me? Is it B, performative? Or, you know, C, is it somewhere in between? But yeah, I mean, you, you definitely shouldn't be, um, you know, penalised for, you know, wanting to hear from people and, and trying to get the best out of them. I, th I think that, you know, or trying to get something from them. Um, you know, you should never you know, knock back people and you should never judge, especially in television, people for interviewing people. Imagine if people judged Michael Parkinson to the people he had on, <laughs> you know? He'd be welcome at every punk gig in the world and never go anywhere else. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think, I think we can all take a moment and go, okay, like he was perfect, but, you know, he was a good interviewer and he was a decent human being and he can have who he wants um you know but then yeah you end up with your Piers Morgan's so like you're not acting in good faith you're not presenting things in a particularly helpful way maybe you having certain people on isn't very helpful it's funny we mentioned Joe Rogan because I was joking with John earlier about Joe Rogan and I was watching Eddie Izzard on Joe Rogan's show which was like wow Eddie Izzard went on that show but it was a really good discussion because they were so chalk and cheese uh Sorry, John, carry on. They are comedians, though. So they do have, you know, that. True. Yeah. True. And I know Joe yeah. respects Eddie Izzard because Eddie Izzard is Eddie Izzard. Sorry. Once again, I'm jumping in. John. <laughs> okay. um, just before you wrap, Simon, I think ultimately for me, the bottom line is good faith. I can't really trust Nick Griffin to have good faith when it comes to his arguments. I've seen his arguments and they're all based on um, BS. So, oh, by the way, there is a cookery program, a pilot. I don't know if you guys have seen it, with Nick Griffin showing you how to cook and the stuff that he comes out with regarding um, <laughs> where curry comes from. It's amazing. I'm going to put that link in the description. Just watching it is a car crash of TV. Um, so, yeah, that's what I have to offer you. Apart from the fact that I think bad faith arguments is something that I really wouldn't want to foster on any particular discussion program and that's my you know that's the basis I guess of me not wanting to have people like that associated with me if I was going to get personal I think when it comes back down to it is people that are controversial make money advertisers want controversial people I know I've kind of jumped off the Twitter stalking people uh, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook stalking people this week because I started to lose my mind but <laughs> i <laughs> but i did start to look at people honestly you know they are the vocal people on facebook going don't watch give me morning britain anymore it's terrible it's really boring i've gone over to sky news i've gone over to bbc instead and it'll be six months before he has his own show on a different network and he will go. The only one who was surprising that didn't come back was uh, Jeremy Kyle. And he was cancelled. <laughs> he was <laughs> gone. And you, I haven't seen him in over two to three years. He might have a radio show, but he might be on the Daily Wire. I, I don't know. I have no idea where he is. Um, so, uh, guys. You, sorry, let's not worry about him. But let's some people do. Him. Some people really <laughs> do worry about him. Um, and, and, and He's got his millions. He'll be fine, honestly. Don't worry about Jeremy Kyle. If you're worried about Jeremy Kyle watching this, it's okay. Please chill out. He's fine. <laughs> okay. If anyone is watching, 
and you know Jeremy Kyle, send him this video or snap this and send him, we are thinking about you, Jeremy Kyle. Okay. <laughs> so I don't want anything to do with him. <laughs> um, but on that note, I, 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 I do want to sort of bring things to a close. So um, in, on, in normal traditional, uh, normal tradition with Rampbox and you know what we do here i want to give each and every one of my panel members um just some time to introduce themselves and tell our viewers what you're up to what you're excited about and where they can find you um let's go with alice please okay so hi i'm alice i am a further education teacher in the northwest um i am currently excited about easter Easter break, but I'm also excited to get back after because we're going to start building our evidence portfolios in lieu of the exams. So that'll be that'll be a good opportunity. Big okay, fantastic. And I would like John to go next, please. Uh, hi, I'm John Clay. I'm a, an author, uh, um, and I've been doing that box for nearly a year now. And I have so much respect, Simon, for taking on this really, really difficult subject with three episodes because, my God, has he been thrown into the deep end? <laughs> so, you poor bastard, Simon. I have <laughs> got through it without running off screen. I, Rob, I wouldn't have judged you otherwise, okay? Um, so, all I'd go. say is my mum is um, actually like, will you, will you go do something else? Please <laughs> stop <laughs> talking to me about this. I am not your sounding board. So I, I've, I've kind of enjoyed it, uh, definitely. But thank you once again, John, for letting me have this opportunity. Uh, Reshma, please. Yeah, I really enjoyed it as well. Thank you, Simon. You've been great. And um, I'm Reshma, and I'm an artist and art therapist. And I work in um, education, um, gang mediation, and anti-extremism. Um, I've got a project that John has very graciously um, accepted to work with me on. He's doing a great job of leading it, and it's going to be on here, Grant Box. And it's about the muse and the artist and their relationship. And um, I'm so excited about it right now. So looking forward to that. Fantastic to hear. Fantastic to hear. Good luck with that in the future. Ollie, the philosopher, please, <laughs> please bring us home. Oh. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Um, my name is Ollie uh, Jostley to my friends. And yeah, I'm a musician and a music producer. Um, you can find me on things uh, like Dorja, um, my, my band and various other bits and pieces. But at the moment, I am super stoked to actually have gigs in my diary. Please, everyone, just wear a mask and stay home and do all the various things so we can meet all these targets so I can not do a boring day job for another year. <laughs> uh, but in, in seriousness, um, if you've watched this far and, and um, you know, and enjoyed this, I'm really grateful that, you know, people have seen this and enjoyed it. And, um, you know, feel free to at me, even if other people don't want to be at it. I'll ask you a question. You can you can certainly try. I'm going to try. Uh, can you rap? I would never deem to rap in the public space. <laughs> but please, if you do become a rapper and you call yourself Ollie the Philosopher, can I be your manager? You absolutely <laughs> can. My can I be your hype With man, please? Can I be your hype man just before you go on stage? Just you, coming at you better than Descartes in, the, in the, something like that. I've got it. I've got a couch at the back of the room with an ashtray. You guys can sit there in the studio and do that thing that they do in movies where they you know, hype out the back. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that leaves Alice and, and I as the back and dancers. This sounds very misogynistic. <laughs> do you know what? You got us. <laughs> you got I, us. <laughs> I, I would like to just clarify that I have never mentioned backing dancers at any point in this. Actually, yeah. <laughs> Wait, did I just get did I just get sold into an idea that I didn't even bring up? Okay. I, I blame my management well and hype man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, I don't think it's that's amazing that is amazing well guys um as you'll see from generally on on ramp box um with when i'm with you know a, a team a panel like this um we we are looking to bring you 
interesting subjects and you know quite deep subjects but we do have fun as well and that's what i love about it um just so you know i'm simon mitchell um i've actually started a new job i'm not i'll talk about it more at different times but i want to know what you're up to in regards to events are you excited about june 21st what really excited me is am i going to be able to uh, bring traditional jamaican pasties to seaside towns I'll let you know more about that. Um, you will find <laughs> Rambox TV. <laughs> uh, you will find Rambox TV. I have a story about that. I'll tell you guys about that afterwards. Um, at, on YouTube. But you will be able to access us at majority of different platforms. YouTube, uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, and anywhere else. Because potentially Twitter. I do LinkedIn. So, um, guys... I, I want to make sure that you have a fantastic week. Um, enjoy yourself and please come back every single Friday for another Rambox TV episode. All the best. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. <laughs>